Thanks for being here. Here's the wonderful news about church. It's a great place whether things are good or whether things are bad, all right? Uh, it's even not a bad place to be when things are rather indifferent in your world. Uh, and so hopefully the time that we spend together today will be one that uh, you will say, as the scripture says, it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. So thanks for coming today. I know there's a lot of things that vie for our attention. There's lots of other things going on. Uh, there are World Series taking place. Well, no, baseball's over, isn't it? I think, yeah, Dodger fans are happy today, all right? Uh, so that's, that, that's good. I hope you all are enjoying it. Uh, <laughs> um, but lots of things are going on that vie for our attention. Uh, hot balloon Sunday, all right, going on out here today. But thank you for being here. Um, yeah, you know what? Five years from now, we're not going to remember who won the World Series. And five years from now, five days from now, we're not going to remember what any of those balloons look like. Uh, but one of these days, we're going to die. I hate to let you in on that fact, but it's reality. It's reality. What's going to count then? And it's often the things that we have learned, discovered, and applied that come from our, our, our times together on a Sunday morning where we learn what makes a real difference, not only for today, but also for eternity. So thanks for choosing New Hope as your place of worship today. If you are a guest today, we are honored by your presence. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you, and I would love for you to fill one out, drop it in the offering bag. We promise we are not going to beat on your door. We're not going to pester you on the telephone. Uh, we don't have anything to sell. We just have some information to share. We'll send in the mail to you. It will come snail mail, all right? It's going to come actually through the post office. Uh, it's going to arrive at your house and it's going to tell you who we are, what we believe, uh, a little bit about our staff, what our service times are, and uh, how you can connect if you choose to connect in various ways with our church. So thank you so very much for doing that. Uh, those cards are also for our regular church family. Uh, if you have messages to the staff or things that you need from us or want us to know, please use the card, put it in the offering. Uh, our staff takes the time every Tuesday morning to sit and look at every one of those cards and address the things uh, to our best of ability that are on them. So would love for you to do that. Uh, now just a small update. Uh, as many of you know, if you're regulars around here, we are remodeling a set of bathrooms over in the other building. They're not available yet this Sunday, but we do think if they, we don't run into any obstacles, challenges, or difficulties, they should be ready two weeks from today. All right? So we'll have them back in full service, and we'll be excited about that. Um, let me highlight a few things and then bring you some updates on prayer requests and praise items, and we'll get engaged in our worship then. Very important thing. Listen very very carefully. This is most important. Next Saturday night before you go to bed, change your clocks, all right? Move them back. You're going to get an extra hour sleep, all right, next week. If you don't, you'll be arriving at a service you were not expecting to arrive at, all right? How do I know that? Because Cecil Spurlock did last Sunday. He sort of jumped the gun on when he was to move his clock forward, all right? Uh, the good news is, he, I, I told on him, I did, but uh, he actually blamed it on his wife Kay, but we know better than that. So uh, anyway, just remember to do that next Saturday evening. We'll try to send out an email the uh, middle part of the week just to remind you as well, but please do that tonight. Uh, <clears throat> some of us are going to be getting together for a very special celebration. Um, this church, as we know it today, called New Hope, is 25 years old. 25 years ago, two churches got together and birthed this one. It was called a merger. A uh, church that I was pastoring in Fresno and the church that was meeting at this location, which then was way, way out in the country, all right? There were no housing develops. There was no Buchanan High School or Alta Sierra. There was no Clovis Community Hospital. None of those things existed, all right? And uh, so we are going to celebrate tonight uh, what these past 25 years have meant to us. And so um, we're going to be at Classic Catering in downtown Clovis for that celebration, our regular Sunday evening service. will not be meeting here tonight because we are going to be meeting uh, over there. So we look forward to doing that tonight. Just a reminder that uh, the pledges are due that we made back uh, in the first part of September for 1040i. Uh, those are due, all right, so that we can get that off and be ready for our mission trip in February. Uh, we also still have about six of our students 
uh, five now? We now have five. It's down, all right? Five of our students to sponsor for a year in Ivory Coast, West Africa, in the little village of Neonan. And these are some of the best and the brightest in the entire country. We've been sponsoring them. This will be year number three, and we want to see them all the way through high school. It's $585 to take care of them from a year. That provides them their clothing, their food, their place where they get to sleep, uh, their books, and their transportation, which is seven miles each way. And it's a dirt path. We were able to provide them bikes at the beginning of two years ago, and we continue to keep those bikes maintained for them on a yearly basis. Can you imagine walking twice a day 14 miles? That's what they do to go to school, all right? And they are thrilled to get to go to school and very disappointed if they don't pass the test to go to school. A very, very different culture, and we want to make a difference in their lives. So uh, out of 36 students, I believe, uh, we just have five left that we need to sponsor. All right, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, several things coming up. Next Sunday night, uh, we will back, be back to having Sunday night service here. It will not be in the bridge where it normally is. It will be in the sanctuary next Sunday night. Uh, next Sunday night is a very, very special evening for two men on our staff. Chris Bishop, our youth pastor, and Mark Addis, our associate pastor, they are being ordained into ministry. Now, some of you say, what in the heck is that? All right? Because, I mean, can I just go online and get ordained from that outfit out of Modesto? Um, <laughs> yes, you can, and it'll do you absolutely no good here. All right? Um, or ordination is the, basically the final step in becoming a, a, a pastor recognized by either a denomination or a church for the rest of your life. There's two steps to this. One is licensing. That's where uh, it's a year by year. It's got to be renewed every year, and it's kind of a um, testing time. Everybody's watching you very closely to see if you've been gifted for ministry and if you have the stamina for ministry and you continue to grow in your knowledge of the Word. And both of these men have done that over these last couple of years. And so um, uh, the board has approved them for ordination, and that service will be next Sunday night. Many of you, how many, just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to an ordination service before? Raise your hand. Okay, very good. How many have not? How many of you just do not want to raise your hand for either reason? It's okay. okay now, the, the, obviously the vast majority of you here have not been to one. So what, what can you expect? Number one, this is a little more formal than a regular service, all right? This is, this is, this is an honorary thing. So this is kind of a big deal. This doesn't mean that you can't come casual, but I have told both of the men that, hey, they need to dress up for this. Um, Chris, I understand, leaned over and asked somebody the other day, he said, I guess I need to go get a suit. And <laughs> they whispered back to him, you need to find shoes first. <laughs> He's a youth pastor. Flip-flops are just fine, all right? So, uh, so anyway, but this is, this, this is a little bit more of a, uh, of a formal affair, all right? Um, the, we will engage in a little bit of worship, but our purpose is not worship. Our purpose is recognition, laying on of hands, as the Scripture says. And so there's kind of a process we go through. It's not a long process, about an hour service. Afterwards, we will have uh, some fellowship time uh, in the pavilion and, and, and in the, uh, the, the bridge building. And um, it is certainly acceptable. This is a big event. So for an anniversary, you would often buy a card, maybe even a gift. You can do either of those. Neither is required but certainly would be appreciated on their behalf. So that will be next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock right here in this room. And let me just pause to tell you, and I'm not going to put anybody out, we had five in our Sunday evening service, which we're running about 35, all right, on Sunday nights. We'd love to have more of you come. Great way to meet other people. Uh, different kind of service on Sunday night. But we had five first-time guests with us, first time to the church ever last Sunday night. Okay, and, and, and one of the family of four is with us this morning, all right? All right, they liked us well enough on Sunday night, they came back on a Sunday morning, all right? So we, we deeply appreciate that, but we would love to have you out for any and all of these services. Uh, on Sunday, November the 12th, a lot's going to be happening. Angel Tree will be kicking off here at the church. You can pick up your angels for the boy or girl that you want to buy a gift who has a mom or a dad that's incarcerated, and in December we will give those gifts in the name of that parent and in the love of Jesus Christ. And those angels will be available two weeks from today. On that same Sunday, it's Volunteer Appreciation Sunday, and our 
our newly commissioned deacon board, who are serving really, really well around the church, are going to be putting on that volunteer appreciation. And those gifts will be available for all of our volunteers out in the pavilion. Uh, on that Sunday evening, uh, we will be having special guests for that evening service called Loving Our Neighbor. As you know, that's kind of a theme that we kick around here very frequently. And uh, it's not really a program, but it's a style of life that we hope more and more of us adopt, that we learn how to love our neighbors. I wanted to do this, so I, I, I moved. I didn't like the neighbors that I was going to have to love where I used to live, and so we, we moved to, that, that's just a joke, that's just a joke, all right? Um, I, the, I still haven't decided how well I like my new neighbors yet, so um, that's also just a joke as well, all right? They're not in the service at the moment, but they, they will be. Uh, so anyway, you're going to enjoy that evening, I think, very, very much. Uh, if you're 55 or older, you are welcome to come to our seniors' luncheon. It's the second Tuesday of every month, and since it's November, that means this is turkey and ham and dressing and rolls and pumpkin pie and pecan pie, and so it's always a great, great meal, and so uh, please put that on your calendar and be sure to attend. In fact, they would like to know if you're going to be able to show up that day because they want to have enough food, all right? Most of the time, it's a potluck on this when we provide most of those resources. Uh, so if you would sign up, it is uh, the second one on that clipboard, and I don't know where the other clipboard is, so it should make its way all the way around. Uh, I think I've covered all those things. Let me highlight a few prayer requests and praise. I'm Joni Anderson, would you stand up, please? Joni Anderson, this is a big week for her. She finished her last radiation treatment this week, all right? <laughs> I don't often jump on Facebook, because uh, once you jump on, sometimes it makes it hard to jump off. Uh, but uh, I got a little uh, signal that Joni had a good Facebook, and so I went and checked it out, and she, uh, it's, it's a great testimony. Um, on there, she talks about how she had wondered when this process started, what was God's purpose in all of this? How would he use what she's going through for his purpose? And she met some really, really wonderful people while she was going through her treatment. And one of those people that she met was a 19-year-old who has a brain tumor back for the second time. And uh, that young girl's parents told Joni how much their daughter loved it when her treatment was on the same day as Joni's, that Joni made a difference for her. And so Joni discovered that what she's going through had a purpose for what somebody else was going through. And what a wonderful testimony. So thank you for sharing that, Joni. Um, I got a uh, message from Mike Murphy, Mike and Pam, part of our church family. Uh, they had discovered a spot on her lung uh, about five weeks ago. She went through a series of tests and then finally a PET scan. The results have turned out very, very good. They could not find anything anywhere else but that one spot on the lung. Um, so they're not going to need to do chemo or radiation. Uh, just follow up on this on a year-to-year -year basis. So that is great news for them and we're praying for them. Continue to remember Mary Ann Levendusky as she goes through her uh, radiation treatments right now. She's part of our 1045 service. Service. This past Wednesday, we had the memorial service for A. Lynn Miller, that is Teddy's sister. Thank you all for your prayers, your support, your encouragement, your assistance in various ways. Uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, Christie's family, Christie's dad's brother, uh, was shot and killed in Clear Lake. Some of you may have seen uh, that on the news, uh, was killed by his son, and uh, there were multiple shootings on that particular day. So just, it's, it's, it, it's tough all the way around, all right? There's not, there's not a good way to go, all right, in this situation. Um, you know, your, 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 your nephew and your cousin is responsible for the death of your brother and your uncle. And so it is a, a, a tragedy all the way around. So just be praying for their family and um, that there are parts of God's family up in Clear Lake that can come around and can make a difference and how God may use us here to make a difference in the family that lives here. On the morning of A. Lynn's service, uh, Joni Cole, part of our 8 o'clock crowd, uh, attended that service and she brought us news that that morning her mother had passed away. Uh, she had brought her into her home just the day before, was going to be going under hospice care the following day. Uh, I just found this out from Dad this morning. Hope he got the story right. <laughs> but, but Dad said um, that the reason she was only going to stay one day with Joni is because she didn't want to live with her daughter. 
<laughs> uh, and so since, yeah, yeah so, so because of that, she just went to heaven, all right? So she didn't have to stay more than one night. So uh, uh, anyway, be praying for Joni and for their family. And those of you who know Joni, please reach out and let her know. Uh, I had a text this week from an old friend of our church family, uh, uh, Jan Parsno. Any of y'all remember Jan? Yeah. Used to be our worship leader around here, all right? And uh, was with us for a long, long time. Joni's now, uh, <laughs> yeah, what's her name? She's now in Tennessee, Jan. And um, she has a dear friend who had uh, a rather tricky kind of delicate heart surgery. She's in ICU at St. Agnes Hospital and asked if I could go visit. We did that and we'll follow up with her again this week. And so uh, her name is Cindy Epperly. So if you'd remember to pray for her, I know they would appreciate that. Then Lori uh, Brigham from our church, part of our eight o'clock crowd. As you know, her husband passed away, and that service is going to be this coming Saturday here at the church at 10 o'clock, and you are certainly invited to come and bring support to Lori on that particular day. And I was handed a couple of notes here. Helen Heath, you're going to have surgery. All right, that's going to be this Friday. All right, is that at Kaiser? Okay, so be praying for her as she has, uh, can I tell them what kind of surgery? Okay, her, her, hernia surgery, all right? Sometimes I don't share. Uh, and then Joe, your son, I understand, is battling an infection right now. All right, so be praying for Marcy's son, Joe. Those are the updates. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would, please. Wait on us as we have our tithes and our offerings. Christmas choir has begun their practices. It's on Thursday night right here in the sanctuary. If you didn't sign up yet, it is not too late. Remember, we are singing for the king's birthday. It is worth our time, our effort, and our availability to prepare. Many will show up in churches all around the world, including New Hope, who don't darken the door of a church at any other time, but they'll come at Christmas time. We need to be prepared to give the king the best on that particular day. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for the beauty of this day. I thank you for the privilege that this day affords to us. Ever since the resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus, from the dead, the church has been gathering on the first day of the week to remember, to celebrate, to commemorate that we believe in the resurrection. For it is the message of the resurrection, it is the truth of the resurrection that validates everything else about the life of Jesus Christ. If he had just been born, and if he had just taught good things, and if he had just done incredible miracles, his life would be meaningless today. Christmas would have no value and there would be nothing uh, to an Easter season. Easter is the message of new life. Easter is the message that death does not have the last word, but life does. So, Father, thank you for the wonderful privilege on Sunday mornings to give testimony to our neighbors and our community that we believe in a risen, living Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. Father, we commit to you all the needs that we've talked about and the needs of so many others that are present on our hearts as we, as we talk with you today. Thank you that know intimately about each and every one of them. Father, thank you for our opportunity of celebration this evening as a church family uh, as we share testimonies and stories about your grace in our lives over the past two and a half decades. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing today, dear Father. We commit all this to you, knowing that we cannot outgive you and we ought not to cheat you. And so we give with a joyful heart today. We do so in the incredible, awesome name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to find the little book of Haggai. All right, last time you're going to have to find it for a while, maybe. You know, you might look it up during the week, but at least on a Sunday morning, uh, you'll find it tucked away, as I've been saying for weeks now, between the Z brothers. It's between Zephaniah and Zechariah. So I invite you to find um, the book of Haggai chapter 2. We'll be focusing our attention on our closing message in this series on verses 20 through 23. Uh, oh, for the last two weeks in preparing for today, I thought I had a couple of really good outlines to preach from. I mean, th there was a lot in these closing verses, and, and I thought, wow, this is going to be a whole lot of fun. I, my, my, my first thoughts went to, man, Haggai was preaching at a time when the world was in trouble and turmoil. Much different than today, the 21st century, very similar. 
And I thought, wow, when the world is in trouble and seems to be out of control, isn't it reassuring to know that God has not lost control? And so I thought, well, that's what we're going to look at. God's in control. When the world seems out of control, he has a sovereign plan. He has supreme power to carry out that plan. And knowing how powerful God is, that gives us confidence. And it also brings to us comfort. Not only does God have a sovereign plan and supreme power, but God has selected people, chosen people who have responded to his message of grace. And when we discover that we're one of his chosen, we now have purpose and privilege in his plan. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good preaching outline, doesn't it? I'm not going to preach it. I moved on because, wow, four times in these two chapters, God tells Haggai to tell the people, consider your ways, consider your choices, consider your faith. And so I thought, okay, boy, we, if he emphasized that four times, that's what we need to wrap up with, consider your faith. And in these last four verses, I mean, there is a very pointed message, and you'll find out more about that in a moment. Uh, the previous three messages that Haggai delivered, it was to the governor, it was to the priests, and it was to the people. In this last few verses, one guy is singled out for the message. This was a very pointed message. Its timing and its target were very pointed. By the way, may I just subtly say this this morning, the fact that you are here this morning, that's God's timing. That also means you are God's target. I'm just saying, all right, if this is not me. This is God's message. If you're here today, he knew about your presence here, and he knew what the message was going to be, and so that means you're part of the target just as Zerubbabel was back then. Uh, this was not only a pointed message, but it was a very powerful message. In these few short verses, it's very severe. I'm going to, I'm going to make riders fall off their horses. I'm going to turn chariots upside down. Kings are going to fall. That's pretty severe. It's also filled with promise in what he tells Zerubbabel he's going to do good through him. And then this message also was a very promising message for Zerubbabel. It was a message that God recognized him, that God wanted to restore him, and most important of all, God had a plan to redeem him. And that's true, but if you're the target of God's message today, that's his message. He recognizes you, he wants to restore you, and he has a plan to redeem you. And I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good outline too. I'm not going to preach that one either. Any more than I already have. I actually, I stumbled across something. And when I say stumble, you have to understand that's tongue in cheek. Through God's providence, I came across an idea from a pastor out of Illinois. I've never met this guy. I was just Googling some research on this particular passage, and I came across this idea, and, and I'm going to borrow it from him today. Been altered a bit for us, but the idea is his. You see, since this is the uh, last sermon in our series from the book of Haggai, and this closing passage centers on just one person, I want to do something different today. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to take on the persona and the character of Zerubbabel. And I am going to explain these four verses utilizing first-person narration. Now, what this is going to require from you are two things. Number one, stay awake. <laughs> Number two, engage your imagination. Because I'm not going to be playing Halloween a few days early and putting on a costume and I forgot to ask Chris if I could borrow his sandals <laughs> and so you're going to have to imagine with me that I am Zerubbabel that's too many syllables for a name so just call me Bill for the rest of the day all right <laughs> You see, in order to understand what we're going to be sharing from, I want to read to you, and you can follow along with me in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time. 
on the 24th day of the month. Tell Bill, the governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and I will shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Bill, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring that a king wore on his right ring finger. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. All right, Tim's going to go away. I'm Bill. I've got to tell you, I felt very alone. I felt very discouraged and disappointed. I was in a downward spiral. I was in a dead-end job that seemed to have no future. I had been promised promotions, but they never came. When I tried to motivate my co-workers, they ignored me, and they did what they wanted to for 16 years. I was born in a foreign country. I never felt like I belonged anywhere. I was embarrassed about my family and I was trying to do all I could to break the cycle of spiritual dysfunction and unfaithfulness. Whenever someone would bring up the name of my grandfather and what he did, I would just cringe and hide. On top of all this, I had a name that people made fun of. Even if I had a hard time spelling it and just to pronounce it reminded me of my unholy heritage. You see, my name's Zerubbabel, which means son of Babel, because I was born in Babylon. My name meant loser as far as I was concerned. Do you ever feel like a failure? I, I, I know y'all live in a different century than I did, but in the 21st century, do you ever feel alone? With all your technology, with all of your activities... You probably never felt discouragement like I did. Are, are, are you ever disappointed with the way things are turning out in your life? As you look at your family tree, do you ever wonder if you can break the generational dysfunction of your family? Do you feel like giving up and quitting? Is, is, is your marriage a mess? Has your confidence in life been shaken? I got to tell you, though I lived centuries before you did, I get a sense that there's a lot of pain among the people who've gathered here today. So I want to just pause for a moment, and I want to briefly pray for you as I tell you my story. I want to pray about what's on your mind and your heart, or maybe you can pray for a, another hurting person that you know. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I bring to you a generation of people from the 21st century. I bring to you some young and some old and some who are older than they think they are. But Father, I bring them all to your attention. You know that there are people in this century that experience things just like I did when I lived. And oh God, I'm glad that I allowed you to intervene in my life and my circumstances because if I hadn't, I would have nothing to say to them today. God, I pray they will hear my story and they'll begin to write a new chapter of their story. In the name of your son, the one I had only hoped to see, but the one in which through the scriptures they have seen, I pray for them. Amen. So let me tell y'all what God taught me. I don't want to bore you with my family background, but it's important that you know where I came from. I come from a line of kings. My grandfather was one of the kings of Judah. His name was a little hard to pronounce like mine. His name was Jehoiakim, or a.k.a. Jeconiah, or uh, uh, Koniah. 
I think he had different aliases because of some terrible things he did. Uh, kind of like the mafia. I'll try to talk more about him later, but every time I bring him up, it makes my heart hurt. When the offer was made to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, I, I, I was all in on that gig. This was my opportunity to make up for all the failures of my family. What a privilege to go and build the temple. This wouldn't be bad. I mean, after all, the king was providing the money and the materials and safe passage to get us home. Uh, I was also going with a group of guys that I really liked to hang out with. These were good dudes. Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah. Who wouldn't want to run around with them? We jumped in and tackled the task that we arrived to do. We worked hard for about two years. We got the foundation finished and the altar built so we could do celebrations and sacrifices. But, but, but God, you know how easy it is to start off strong and then boom, we hit a wall. My, team, my, my teammates started getting bogged down by, by all the opposition and problems we were facing. Work was challenging. And then they started whining about how they never got a chance to work on their own places. So they just stopped working for 16 years, God. Your house was in ruins, but man, our homes were beautiful and opulent. People even borrowed materials for the temple to panel their own living spaces. In the interest of full disclosure, I got to tell you, I became self-centered too. I began thinking I could do life without God in the center. I was frustrated, God, that they wouldn't listen to me and I felt like a failure because I couldn't rally them. I also started feeling sorry for myself. Here I was, the governor. But really, what did I govern? I also started feeling sorry for myself. Uh, my relatives were royalty, and here I was in a dusty, dry land. Uh, I was just a governor and a lame leader at that. I guess my family's curse and dysfunction were my destiny as well. But when I was at my lowest, God's word came to me right at the right time. Some of you can relate to how wonderful it is to encounter God's word at just the right moment. When all hope had almost evaporated, God used his scripture to speak to me. It was during that same day that Haggai preached the sermon that's recorded in chapter 2, verses 10 through 19 of that little book. That sermon motivated the people of Israel to persevere in their task. He rallied the forces that day and God blessed them. But, but later that day, the Lord came to Haggai a second time. I thought that maybe God had some more preaching for the people. But this time, God singled me out. At first, I was afraid that the Almighty was going to clobber me and continue the curse on my life. But it wasn't like that at all. Haggai said, tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I was surprised when I heard Haggai speak my name from God. But grateful to know that God was thinking about me and he had a message for me. Uh, some of you need to know this morning, God is crazy about you. That's why he orchestrated your presence here today. God, if God had a refrigerator in heaven, you'd be a magnet on his refrigerator door. Some of you need to hold on to the words of the book of Psalm that David wrote in 139 verses 1 through 4. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Oh no. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. After hearing my name, I was then called governor. I didn't want to be reminded I was governor, but God knew that's what I was. Likewise, God knows the situation right where you are right now. And then God said some things that really got my attention. God wasn't finished with me yet. He had a plan, and he was going to carry out that plan. Babylon was big, but God was bigger still. Persia was powerful, but God was even more powerful. God was weaving his way and his will for his glory, as he always does in the fabric of broken situations and fallen people. 
Oh, I got to tell you, I was really struck by the forcefulness of those words that God spoke to me. There were no maybes or mites about it. What God said he would accomplish, he was going to carry out. Let me tell you what he said to me. He said, Zerubbabel, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones. I will shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will throw chariots upside down with their drivers. Horses and riders will fall. Uh, Man, I got to tell you, the first thing that came to my mind was this. He's God, and I'm not. You see, it's all about the fact that the Almighty wins in the end. These words made me think of how God shook the heavens and the earth when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And it wasn't for their lack of hospitality, as some will try to make you believe today. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of rampant immorality. Premarital, postmarital, extramarital homosexuality. All of those are the reasons that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Billy Graham said 50 years ago, if God doesn't come soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I also remember what God did to the Egyptians when their chariots and drivers were wiped out by the waters of the Red Sea. Everywhere I looked and saw reminders of the power of Persia, but God was way more powerful. God was about to do something in the future, only this time it would be even bigger. I was encouraged to hear what God was going to do as he shook up the kingdoms of this world. 1 John 2, 17 says, The world and its desires pass away, but the person who does the will of God lives forever. Do you like the idea of living forever? Simple. Do the will of God. (laughs) Did you all hear that? Wow. I, I don't know what I did. Okay. Back to Bill. At this moment of my life, I discovered that when I knew what God's future plans were, it gave me hope in spite of my past. And then I heard the Lord Almighty say, on that day, I knew that this was a reference to the coming of the Lord. Many of the prophets use similar words to refer to the last days. When the phrase comes up, it's a signal that what follows has to do with the future. What God said next made me quickly realize that while he uses my name, he was also talking about me as a picture and a representative of the kingly line of the tribe of Judah. Let let me see if I can explain what I mean by walking through the the phrases found in verse 23 of Haggai chapter 2. He says, I will take you. The word take is a common verb in Hebrew that was used when God changed the status of somebody's life. My mind went back to the history lessons I'd been taught as a child in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8, when God said this about David, I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to being ruler over my people Israel. God took me from Babylon in captivity, and he sent me back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But I think he had more in mind, because this word was also used of kings being anointed to kingship. That was big. It gave me hope. The the next line in this verse is, My servant Zerubbabel. When he called me a servant, I got spiritual goosebumps. Well, this was a compliment. There's more to this title. It made me feel like I wasn't just a governor, but I was actually part of God's appointed ones. The word servant was used in many passages referring to Jesus, the coming Messiah or promised one. One such verse is found in Isaiah 43, 1. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I find delight. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the nations. And that was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. The same prophet in chapter 53, verse 11, book of Isaiah. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. That tells us what Jesus did on the cross. I'm a servant in a picture of the kind of servant that Jesus would be one day.
The next line was son of Shealtiel. By referring to my father, I was being reminded again of my royalty beginnings. It's in my genealogy. I will make you my signet ring. Three words were ringing in my ears. Shake, take, and make. He was going to shake things up, take me from being a lonely leader, and make me into something that was going to, 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 to hard for me to get my head around. You can't relate to this in, in your culture of the 21st century, but a, a signet ring was a common symbol of honor, authority, and power. This ring was used to seal documents as it was pressed into hot wax. A king guarded this ring with his life because it represented his authority, power, and position. Today, we use notaries to authenticate ownership. They put the seal on the signature. The seal on our passport says that the authority of your country recognizes you and the power of your country is standing behind you. A signet ring accomplishes all of this and more. God was telling me that he was going to turn me into his signet ring. He would use me as his authority in the world. There's more significance to this, but I'm going to have to explain what happened to my grandpa in order for you to fully understand what God was saying to me. Before I do, I need to be up front about what my great-grandfather did. His name was Jehoiakim. When confronted with the Scripture, instead of believing what God said, he decided to burn the Scriptures. I heard that things still happen today in the 21st century. When people read the Bible, they choose to toss it aside, to ignore it. Or when they say, I know the Bible says this, but they don't know my situation, so it's okay for me to do this. The story about my great-grandpa is found in Jeremiah 36. I grew up knowing what verse 31 said. I will punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I will bring on them and those living in Jerusalem and the people of Judah every disaster I pronounced against them because they have not listened so since timing brought you here today and you are the target, the question is this, have you been listening? I got to be honest, that's not much of a family blessing, is it? Okay, now let me tell that was my great grandpa, now let me tell you about my grandpa. He only served as a king for three months, <laughs> pretty short. Then he was deported, taken into captivity to Babylon. I'm going to read to you from the prophet Jeremiah. I'd like you to listen to the word, listen for the word signet ring in this passage. Jeremiah 22, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would pull you off. I will hand you over to those who seek your life, those you fear, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will hurt you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you were born and where you both will die. You will never come back to the land you long to return to. And there's more, <laughs> if that wasn't enough for you. This is what the Lord says, record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper during his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Well, folks, I'm one of his offspring. I'm Bill, Zerubbabel. Sort of one of his offspring. I don't tell this to a lot of folks, not because I'm embarrassed, but because I'm not entirely sure of all the facts. But I believe I was adopted by a man named Shealtiel. There's a clue about my beginning in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 19, where my birth dad is named Pedadei. What lousy names they had. Check this out. If I was adopted then into this family then I did have all the rights of sonship. But the curse that came from my grandpa would not fall on me. Or at least that was what I held on to throughout my life. But right now, in the time of Haggai, I thought everything was coming to pass in my life and I was under the curse. Let me stop and ponder this. If my grandpa was told that he was like a signet ring that was pulled off, then could God be reversing the curse and making me into a signet ring? 
But how could that be? Could God actually restore me to right relationship with him again? There's one more phrase found in verse 23. For I have chosen you. I was now convinced that while God was speaking to me, he had me and his chosen one both in mind at the same time. And do you understand that what God thought about me then is what God thinks about you today? You and I can become the chosen people of God because we become the joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We become adopted into God's family. The curse of humanity is no longer on me, but the blessings of sonship is. Wow, I wish I'd preach that instead of Zerubbabel. Well, folks, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it because God has stuck with me all these years. Just before I leave your century, I'd like to pass along a couple of lessons I've learned through my life. Life lesson number one, let God's Word fill your mind. If you want to hear a word from God, you must be in the word of God. Don't wait for a feeling or an experience or the preacher to outdo himself on Sunday. Tim probably won't let that happen very often. Instead, soak yourself daily in the scriptures. Zechariah wrote in chapter 4, verse 6, God singled me out again with a wonderful promise this time and a reminder because I'm prone to do things out of my own strength. And here's a word that God gave to me from Zechariah. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Could he be any more pointed? Not by might, not by power. Do you know the rest of it? But by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. This was directed to me, but I'm happy to share it with you. Are you in the word consistently? The second life lesson I learned is to trust God's timing. Have you noticed that we almost always have to wait for God to do something? That's okay, though. That's the way he's designed it. The words he said to me didn't come to fulfillment for 500 years when Jesus was born. But God's timing was perfect, and he'll be perfect in his plan for you. Listen to the five times God uses the pronoun I in these four verses. I will shake. I will overturn. I will overflow. I will take you. I will make you. If you've been waiting something for a long time, hold on to Isaiah 14, 24. Surely as I've planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. When problems seem to be dominating your life, believe in God's promises. They have dominion over your problems. Life lesson number three. This life is all about Jesus. Always has been. Always will be. Did you notice that I just sort of disappear from the scene after showing up in a couple of books of the Bible? Do you know why? Because life is not about me. It's about Jesus. God was reversing the curse beginning with me, and now my descendant, Jesus Christ, has taken the rightful place on the throne of David. The angel Gabriel announced it in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, 32 and 33. I think you all call this thing Christmas. And Luke said, he will be great and be called the son of the most high God. He will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Check this out. You got to understand, for a guy like me, for Zerubbabel, for a guy like me, this is absolutely crazy. Both the gospel writer Matthew and the gospel writer Luke list my name in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The governor who was failing miserably at building the temple got listed in both genealogies of the one who was at the center of it all. God is so good. And speaking of Jesus, he became the signet ring of God the Father according to John 6, 27. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval and in Hebrews 1, 3 adds this, the Son, S-O-N, capital S-O-N, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. 
Remember this, when you are reading the Old Testament or the New Testament, when you're looking for prophecies and representations of Jesus Christ, that's what you need to be studying because the Scripture is filled with the Savior. The clearest statements about all of this in the Bible comes from Jesus himself when in Luke 24, 27, he said, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to those disciples on the road to Emmaus all the Scripture said about him. The fourth lesson I've learned in life is God can free you from dysfunction. Do you all have dysfunction in the 21st century? Uh, you know, I heard something about a group called Celebrate Recovery. I think you all still must be dysfunctional. God can reverse the curse. You can do things differently than your parents or grandparents did or that you've even done in your past. God can start a new family tree beginning with you. Pour into your kids and your grandkids, into your nieces and nephews, and fill in the gap that was there. Jesus died in our place, taking our punishment so that we could be set free. We could say it like this, because of grace, Jesus took my place. Maybe you think you don't qualify because you've messed up so much. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what Jesus has done. There is grace for everyone. Jesus has promised to set us free. And in John 8, 36, he says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. No questions asked. Let me share with you my last life lesson. Why don't you join God's team? For if you want to win... That's the only team that ends up winning. If you're on God's team by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will win. Some of you might wonder how I can say that. Well, I can say that because God wins in the end, and if you're on his team, we all win. If you're born again, you've admitted that you were a sinner, believe Jesus is your Savior, invite Him to be in your life, then you have been sealed with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. According to Ephesians 1, having believed, you were marked with a seal, the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. 2 Timothy 2, 19, Paul says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His. Are you his? Are you his? Check out the last two words of this book. Lord Almighty. Sounds similar to a movie theme, doesn't it? This title, Lord Almighty, means the God of the armies of heaven. You see, life is not about me, and it's not about you. It's all about the Lord Almighty. There's a battle going on between good and evil. The battle's already been won. It's a finished outcome already. The question is, have you chose the winning side? Have you invited Jesus in your life? Let's pray. Dear Father, there are those who are here today who have identified with part of my story. There are some who feel lonely and discouraged. Today, I hope they've discovered they never have to be lonely again. Father, there are some who battle dysfunction. I hope they've heard dysfunction doesn't have to win. There can be a change of life, but it starts with the words of life being part of our thought process. And then our will submitting to the truth of your scripture. Oh God, do for these people in the 21st century what you did for me 500 years before your son was born in Bethlehem. I pray that today, 2,100 years later, they will let the babe of Bethlehem be birthed in their heart as the savior of their life. They begin now to live out of the reality of a new family tree, one that has you as their roots. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, Bill is gone, and I'm back.
God bless you. Have a great day.